I've always felt welcomed here. It's been a few years since I've been with you. It's always been a pleasure. I've been longtime friends with former pastor Dick Haney. Came in 87 to be pastor at Cambridge Baptist Church, which was there for almost 12 years. And I've been involved with Pastors Fellowship and, like I say, have valued Pastor Haney's friendship and support over the years. It's good to be back with you. And uh, may seem like a strange Christmas message, but we hear all of the information about Christmas, the birth of Jesus, the immaculate, or you know, the virgin birth, and all all of that's good information to have. But then you have to ask yourself, why? Why? Have the Romans 12, 1 and 2 up here for you? It was red, but I've got it on PowerPoint to follow along. Sometimes we hear information, but we don't quite get it right, do we? Stories told of a little boy who just dearly loved his grandmother, and he got to spend the weekend with grandma. He was going to make her happy by making her bre breakfast in bed. Eggs, bacon, sausage, pancakes, the works, coffee. She ate it down, went so glad to have the little boy think that highly of her until she got to the cup of coffee. It was the nastiest thing that she could barely swallow. At the bottom, a clink on her teeth. Looked in the cup and there were three these little green toy army soldiers. Uh, Sonny, what's with the little soldier toy soldiers in my cup? I heard it on, gra on TV, Grandma. The best part of waking up is soldiers in your cup. For those of the younger generation, that's the Fold Folgers ad. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Well, he didn't quite get it right, did he? <laughs> Humorous story, and sure, I would hope it's not true. <laughs> is Christianity, is our faith just informational, or is it beyond that? Information is good, and we need to base our faith on good doctrine. I'm not saying... Oh, forget doctrine, let's just all get along and worship Jesus. That's not where I am at all. It goes a step further. Information that we are talking about doctrine, good doctrine from infallible word of God, should bring about transformation. That's why the focus is on Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what's good and acceptable and perfect. I draw your attention to one three-letter word in the Greek, a little bit longer. I appeal to you, therefore. Preposition. What is that therefore, therefore? Prepositions link two things. It's therefore, <laughs> therefore is there, because it refers to the first 11 chapters where Paul lays out the information, the doctrine, this thing that he calls the gospel. What is the gospel? We say it's good news, and yes, it is good news. But what does that look like? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for transformation of all who believe, Jew first and then the Gentile. The good news, bad news of the gospel, the bad news is, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's me. That's you. Why would Jesus come, be born a human, suffer terrible death on the cross. He did it because of God's love. Go skip to chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Or chapter 5, verse 8. God shows his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died who for? Us. That's the gospel. That's why the baby was born in a manger. That's why he came, left heaven's throne to take on human form, to suffer the same weaknesses in the flesh that all of us do. That's why knowing the outcome, being God, the Son, part of the Trinity, he knew what his mission was, to show people God's love in practical ways, healings, teaching, to call them to account for their false ideas, that they didn't get the law right, <laughs> 
the Pharisees thought you get to heaven by being a Jew, you still have to keep all of the 603 rules and regulations that are in the Old Testament law. No, no. Jesus said, get down to the issue of what's in your hearts. It's what's in your hearts that defile you, not, what you, not the food that you put in your mouth. That therefore is therefore because it refers to the first 11 chapters, which is information. If you look at the Bible in context, the New Testament epistles of Paul, he almost always starts with doctrine, information. But he doesn't stop there. Information at this level demands a response from the people that hear the information, and they're held accountable for what they know. Note the three exhortations as we proceed. They're in the imperative. Give yourselves, present your bodies, give yourselves. Don't be conformed, and then be transformed. They're imperative. Just a point of grammar, imperatives are not always firm commands. Do this and you'll be good. I like to view it more as encouragement. Like we say, go team, score again, tackle him, get the ball. You're offering encouragement. Paul is encouraging them to live the Christian life the way it's designed to be lived, from the inside out, be, being transformed, rejecting the conformity that the world tries to squeeze us into the mold, giving ourselves fully to him. That can be a scary thing, can't it? Well, if I do that, oh, who knows? God might send me to be a missionary in Africa. Guess what? He did. I've been to Africa ten times on mission trips. It's fantastic just got back from a fantastic two weeks in Acapulco, Mexico, not sitting on the beach. If you read the news, October 26, Hurricane Otis brought 165 mile an hour winds that flattened the town. I mean, a tangled mess. Samaritan's Purse, Billy Graham's, uh, Franklin Graham's organization stepped in. Within a week's time, had four water filtration systems enough to provide 100,000 people. Their motto, helping in Jesus' name. Army was there providing food. I'm a chaplain with the rapid response team with Billy Graham. Saw 50 salvations, transformed lives, people coming to get food and water. Wouldn't even look up. 50 people when we talked to them and engaged. You know, why, why do you think the Samaritan's Purse people are here putting roofs on your houses? Why do you think they're bringing food and medicine in? Well, they said something about God's love. Yeah. Would you like to know more about God's love? Hearing testimonies of people that when the hurricane hit, all the neighbors gathered in the middle of the living room and huddled together. And they watched the roof go. Then they watched the walls all go, but they were still alive. I think God spared us. Yeah. Would you like to know? Would you like to know that God personally? And with every one of those 50 people, most of them with depressed, defeated looks, would brighten up and smile. You could see the transformation when they embraced Jesus in, in, spite, in spite of the loss of everything that they had in this, of this world's goods, including their homes and some of them family members. Offer yourselves to God. I like the living translation, living, living, um, new living. So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Think about what has he done for you. That demands a response. He calls us to offer ourselves to him with no holds barred. Lord, as Isaiah said at that call, you know, who, who will I send to tell my people about me and what they're doing wrong and how they can get things right? Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. When you offer yourself to God, life takes on new meaning may not call you to be a missionary to Africa or Acapulco or uh, Lewiston, Maine. I was a chaplain down there within a day of, after the shooting, bringing the hope of the gospel that the world knows nothing of. The world offers false hope. Don't be, in view of the God's mercy, offer yourselves to him. Why? Because of what he's done for you. That's the message of Christianity. That's the message of the cradle in Bethlehem. That's the message of the cross on Calvary. God calling people into his eternal family from a world that's lost in darkness and sin. 
offer yourselves to God. Other religions say, do this, do that, you'll be good with God. They're works-based. They're works-based. Our religion, I, I use that term in a proper way, uh, calls us into a relationship not because of what we've done, not because of what we do. Islam is toe the line, do everything in the Quran, and give yourself to religion and hope for the best on Judgment Day. Other world religions and even some with some sects and denominations within Christianity say, do this, do this, do this, do, 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 do more, try harder. No, it's not do more, it's be more. Be more submitted, more yielded to him and his spirit and you will find new purpose to life and new peace in your relationships might bring persecution. I'm not saying it's an easy road necessarily. Don't be conformed, the second exhortation. Don't be conformed to the world around you. I like the old Phillips, J.B. Phillips to paraphrase, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. What mold is that? The world has many molds, religious molds, if you will, or philosophical molds that want to squeeze people into that mold. If you were born and brought up in Saudi Arabia, you would hear from the cradle on up, Israel stole the land from us Arabs. Jews are nothing but dirty, money-grubbing people that need to be exterminated. Same message that Hitler convinced a whole generation of. I have a good friend that I visited, missions trip to Northeast Africa twice. He spent 10 years teaching at an international school in, in Saudi Arabia map of the world he put up. Left the room for lunch, come back, Israel. Somebody taken a magic marker and marked out Israel. Teacher, there is no Israel. It's Palestine. It's ours. The Jews stole it from us. That's a mold that your more radical Muslims are squeezed into from the cradle to the grave. What kind of molds does the world squeeze us into today? I would say that the biggest mold that the world would squeeze us into is the mold of mediocrity. You know, go to church, give some money, you know, put, put a little money in the offering plate and sing the songs and put up a nice Christmas tree and just be a good moral person and you'll be good. You may be saved, but a lot of Christians are mediocre in their approach instead of wholehearted. I'm following Jesus and I'm going to tell everybody I can without being in their face and obnoxious about it. Mold of med spiritual mediocrity, the surveys among evangelicals, evangelical meaning people that say they believe the Bible and believe Jesus died for their sins, a little under 50% think it's wrong to try to convince friends and neighbors and people of other religions. They think it's wrong to try to convert, try to convince them to convert. I'm preaching to the choir because I doubt I, this church would not do that, but how often do we not speak up? when we have a chance to. The moral decline in our society is undeniable. Undeniable. You know, who would have thought 20 years ago boys can say, oh, I'm a girl today, or I'm a cat today, or whatever, you know, the gender fluidity and the gender confusion. Who would have thought that? You know, homosexuality when I was growing up was in the closet. It was around, but nobody talked about it. Nobody came so-called out of the closet until the 60s and 70s. But how many Christians, I, it appalls me, the number of young people, teenagers, that again surveyed think, it's fine if somebody wants to change gender, it's kind of cool. That's a mold that the world is, has squeezed a younger generation into. Mold of mediocrity, it's wrong. You just don't take things too serious, don't be pushy, don't be obnoxious. Why you might make, somebody might not like you, might even cost you your job. They're, increasing number of teachers in public schools and universities that are losing their jobs or being disciplined simply because they will not accept gender changing pronouns. Even some, some cases in the news currently being disciplined because they refuse to lie to parents when their child says I'm, I've changed gender, I've changed the pronouns from him to, her, him to her or her to him. And No, don't buy the mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into that mold. This book, it isn't a book, it isn't a bunch of rules and regulations, but 
This is how the Christian life is designed to be lived. Transformation based on good, unchanging, infallible information. The information doesn't stop there. It transforms. Be transformed. Be transformed. Be transformed. That's a passive tense. It's not change yourselves. Get better, do more, try harder. No. The Holy Spirit will transform you from the inside out when you give yourself to him, when you recognize the false, the lies that the world tries to squeeze you into. Those are lies that are destroying our society, the very fabric of family in our society, for Christian and non-Christian alike. Don't let the world convince you of those lies. Know what the Word says. Know it. Live it. Live it in a loving way. Be transformed. Be transformed. Let Him transform you. Let that Holy Spirit that comes within bring change, change of attitude, change of heart, which will lead to change of behavior. Joshua told people, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 9 to 11, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Don't let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in, your heart, in my heart that I might not sin against you. What's important to you? What's really important to you? Is Jesus, is Jesus and your walk with him really the first place in your heart and your lives? By all means, do the right things. You know, mold of mediocrity and appalled. I'm preaching to the choir here because you're here. <laughs> And I'm appalled at the number of people that surprised me that just got out of the habit of going to church and don't really see the need to get back in fellowship in, in the context of a church post-COVID. Thank you, COVID. But um, that, that's another mold. Yeah, just don't get too serious. Just, just chill. You want people to like you, don't you? You don't want people to make fun of you. You don't want to be taken into account by the human resource officer at work. Be transformed. Be transformed. Let him do the work. As you give yourself to him, he will do what only he can do. And that's give you the peace and purpose in your life that you've never known before. Made that decision shortly after getting saved. I kind of lived with one foot in the world and one, one in the church. But as I grew, finally it just dawned on me. I need to be all in. This is not just something to toy with. It's not just something that I need to do more and try harder. Before I got saved, I thought being a, becoming a Christian meant giving up all your fun. I was a frat boy. Ponytail, motorcycle riding, beer guzzling, pot smoking, adrenaline junkie. I thought I'd have to give up all of that fun. But yet on the inside, I was a very empty young man laughing on the outside, the life of the party, but knowing something was desperately wrong and missing in my heart. God changed that. Found out like, October 17th, 1972, I yielded my life, asked Christ to forgive me of my sins and come in and give me himself, give me what only he could give me, forgiveness, a clean heart, and a fresh start. No, what? I didn't have the desire anymore to go out to the bars every night. Didn't have a desire to smoke weed anymore. I still like to do the adrenaline things, you know, riding motorcycles, scuba diving, and skydiving. Those aren't sinful as long as they don't become idols. But I didn't have a desire to do that anymore. I thought the Bible was the most boring book ever written. I grew up going to church. I could tell you the stories of David and Goliath and the and the you know, Christmas scene and the crucifixion, and that was head knowledge. I didn't deny that that was true, but it hadn't changed my life because I had not yielded myself to it. He changed me. Not overnight. He's still changing me. I'm a, I'm a saint. If you accept Christ, you're a saint. God doesn't call you dirty, rotten sinners. 
you're a saint who will still sin because we have the flesh and we're we're tempted, but we're saints. We're new creatures. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Are you frustrated with the Christian life? Too hard for you? Too much to give up? Hmm. Rather frustrating way to live if you know you're holding back. I'm not saying you do everything perfect, but if you're holding back, he wants all of you. Your heart, your body. Your body is, of course, in body and contain the soul and the spirit. So all of you, that's what he wants. Don't hold back. To do so leaves you with frustration, broken relationships, ineffective witness if you just live like the world does and are not distinct. If you're frustrated, like the guy who complained every day at lunch, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. His co-worker sit down with his co-worker and complain. Open his lunchbox, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I hate these things. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich again today. His co-worker says, well, why don't you have your wife make something different? He said, because I make my own lunch. <laughs> it's a choice that we make. It's a choice that we make. Living with the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you and empower you to live life to the fullest that's pleasing and acceptable to him, as it says here in verse 2. That's the only way that I want to live. How about you? Let's pray. Not gonna make. Not gonna have an altar call. Not gonna have a show of hands with every eye, head bowed, eye closed. But if you've been holding back, if you've been holding back on him, just confess that to him. Say, Lord, I want to be all that you want me to be. I want to do all that you are calling me to do. Lord, I acknowledge that only you can give me that fresh start. Pray that in your heart right now. Pray that. Tell him. Tell him what's on your heart. Ask him to give you that fresh start, a clean heart, a clean, clear conscience, and a new life, and a new purpose for living. Pray this in Jesus' name. I love to hear people's stories and talk to them about where they are in their spiritual journey. We're all pilgrims just passing through, and we're at different stages, so I'm available afterward if anybody would like to talk with me personally about what you've heard today. Just one more song, huh?